recording. All right, uh, greetings, uh, fellow virtual travelers. Uh, my name is Richard Haddock with the East Asia National Resource Center at the George Washington University. Uh, and uh, welcome to our event uh, this evening in DC, uh, Morning in Asia on Democracy in Action, Past and Present Movements in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Myanmar. Uh, before we get into the discussion, I just wanted to uh, point your attention to a few kind of logistical items of how we usually run our webinars. Uh, right now we're using the WebEx webinar platform. Uh, so you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen, a Q and A feature. Um, if you can't see it, there should be a little three dot icon at the right hand side that you can click and uh, decide to use the Q&A feature or the little chat bubble. Uh, we ask that you submit your questions throughout the event using the Q&A feature and that uh, you make, uh, please make sure to address your questions to everybody so that we can all see questions being asked. And we also ask that you include your name and affiliation so that we know who we are addressing and how we can uh, best address your question. Uh, throughout the event, our staff will be assisting our moderator, keeping track of all questions. So we'll do our best to ask as many questions as possible. But again, please, throughout the event, uh, do not be afraid of using the Q&A chat feature. Also, as we're using webinars, uh, no one's video cameras will be viewable, only the panelists that you see here. And that also includes for the recording. So after the event, when the recording's finished, we will upload the video to YouTube and send the link out to all our attendees so that you can watch, uh, continue to watch this great roundtable over and over again. Uh, that should be just about all the technical items. Uh, before we continue, though, I'd like to introduce uh, our moderator and associate director of the Seeger Center for Asian Studies, Dr. Deepa Alapoli. She is a political scientist specializing in Indian foreign policy, India-China relations, and Asian regional and maritime security. She's research professor of international affairs, associate director of the Seeger Center, and director of the Rising Powers Initiative a major research program that tracks and analyzes foreign policy debates in aspiring powers of Asia and your Asia. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Deepa Alapoli. Thank you so much, Richard. Good day, everyone, wherever you happen to be right now. I'm delighted to welcome you all on behalf of the Seeger Center to today's round table on democracy in action, past and present movements in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Myanmar. I'm happy to say that we've had a massive number of registrants, and I can assure the audience that you'll not leave disappointed. Thanks to the remarkable speakers that are assembled, two of them joining us from early morning in Taiwan. So thank you both very much, uh, Michael and Shirley. This is the third edition of the Seeger Center's ongoing Taiwan Roundtable for 2021. You can listen to our earlier roundtables on the center's YouTube channel or look up the Asia report that summarize the events on our website. On today's topic, given the serious setbacks that democratic forces are facing in Asia, in particular in Hong Kong and Myanmar, it seemed like a good time to take a look at these two protest movements that are struggling at the moment and put them up against a highly successful past democracy movement in Taiwan, which continues to flourish and serve as a model. Of course, many things have changed since the 1980s, especially the geopolitical context, but I think you'll see there are some very interesting parallels and lessons despite the differences. The role of youth and the role of different types of media and the innovative way they're used seems to be at least two strong parallels between all three of the cases. And speaking of media, uh, I want to take just a couple of minutes to alert the audience to an important media asset that we're lucky to have at GW, which is a large collection of Taiwan's Dang Wai, that is opposition journals, that emerged during the years of Taiwan's democracy movement. These journals played a historic role, as we will hear today from our speaker, Dr. Michael Shao, who's both an observer and participant in the movement. A few words on our collection. 
Its range is approximately 70 titles of opposition journals, including Formosa Magazine and the Freedom Era Weekly, spanning the years 1977 to 2002. And I'm really happy to report that GW Gelman's Library's Global Resources Center is working with partners in Taiwan, including the National Taiwan University, the National Human Rights Museum, and the Chilin Foundation to digitize and combine our respective Dongwei collections to be offered online as a comprehensive resource for others. Uh, the pandemic and related issues have caused some delays, but we anticipate the digitization process to pick up speed in the next few months, and we are hoping to be able to have a formal launch of it in the future, and hopefully we'll do that in person and hopefully get Dr. Xiao in person. Well, today we have a lot of ground to cover with Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Myanmar on the agenda. And I'm delighted now to introduce our panelists and discussant. I'm gonna give very brief introductions because all four of them have too many accomplishments for me to list, and you can find their full bios on the invitation on the website. Uh, they'll each have about 10 to 12 minutes um, so let me just say, uh, I'll start off with uh, Dr. Michael Shao, highly influential expert from Taiwan who wears many different hats in the academic and policy worlds. He's senior advisor to the president of Taiwan, chairman of the Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation, chair professor of Hakka studies at the National Central University, and that's just a start. Um, he's widely published and is a leading scholarly authority on civil society and social movements. And uh, he is going to speak to us today on Taiwan's democratic legacy and the role of Dang Wai Journal in popular mobilization. I'm actually going to introduce all of the speakers and then start the event. Um, Dr. Shaw will be followed by Dr. Karis Templeman who's research fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, and he manages the project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific. He has published extensively, including in the Comparative Political Studies, in the Taiwan Journal of Democracy, and International Journal of uh, Taiwan Studies. He will speak to us today on the changing dynamics of the democracy movement in Hong Kong, and where he'll give a comparative take on uh, uh, sorry, on Hong Kong, and a comparative take on Taiwan as well. We will then shift westward in the Indo-Pacific to Myanmar and bring in Dr. Christina Fink, my colleague here at GW, where she is Professor of Practice of International Affairs. She's a leading expert on Myanmar's politics and society and is the author of the book, Living Silence in Burma, Surviving Under Military Rule, as well as the author of many journal articles and book chapters on Myanmar's political reform and society. She will speak to us on understanding Myanmar's spring revolution. And specifically, she asked me to use the title spring revolution, which I'm sure she'll explain why. All right, so once the panelists have finished their remarks, I will call on the incomparable Shirley Lin to give us her own commentary and then to lead a conversation with the speakers. Dr. Lin is one of the world's leading scholars on Taiwan and Hong Kong, as well as a highly sought after public intellectual, and I'm really honored to call her my friend. She has many titles and accolades. She's the Compton Visiting Professor in World Politics at University of Virginia, a non-resident scholar at Brookings, adjunct professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and most recently, she is appointed the chair of the Asia Pacific Hub of the Commission on Reform for Resilience. That's a mouthful, but it is reviewing the response to the COVID pandemic. It's a very high level uh, commission. What a task. Good luck, Shirley. Now, I know that both Dr. Shao and Dr. Lin have fascinating personal stories associated with the democracy movement in Taiwan and Hong Kong, and I hope that they'll share some of that with us today. And with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Shao, and actually all of the presenters have PowerPoints, so please bear with us as we get that rolling. And thanks again. Please 
ask, please ask, make sure to ask your questions as we go along. Michael, over to you. Michael, I think you're muted. Oh, can you hear? Yes, now I can. Thank you. Okay. Okay, first of all, I'm very happy to be here. I'm invited to speak about um, uh, my view about the Danwai opposition magazines in Taiwan's early democracy making uh, process between 1970 and 80s, um, especially on the role of the uh, Danwai opposition magazine. Uh, and first of all, uh, secondly, I'd like to congratulate that uh, GW has the very good collection of the opposition uh, magazine uh, in the library uh, and also digitized. And I think it will be very useful for students and the scholars who are interested in the Asian democracy, especially in Taiwan democracy in the early period. Because uh, uh, in my view, the opposition uh, magazine or Danwai magazine as a as a way to in to provide enlightenment for many many people in the country so that they can understand that the, the democracy is all about. So I think it's very important for GW to widely publicize this collection. Okay, let me start with the uh, the the early period under the under the martial law under the under the authoritarian regime, there are very few outlets of the opposition or the uh, democratic voices and action under the KMT party state authoritarianism between uh, before 1987. 87 was the year of, to leave the martial law. And that was uh, usually by scholar considered as the beginning of the democratization. And before that is the liberalization. Uh, there are four outlets. Uh, still, some outlet can be can be viewed as the outcry for democracy. Number one is a local election. Since early 1950s, especially after the 1954 Taiwan Provincial Assemblyman elections, that provided limited political space for the non-KMT oppositions to take part in Taiwan's local political process. Let me emphasize local political process. Since 1970s, terms like Danwai, Danwai means outside the party. The party means KMT, so it's outside the KMT uh, or Danwai coalition, uh, the coalition outside KMT and Danwai movement were created and have become popular since 1970s. Second outlet is a few, again, let me emphasize few, liberal intellectuals within the KMT circle or religious groups outcry against authoritarian rule and de demands for political reform and democracy between 1950s and 70s. For example, the Yuan Ju uh, through uh, uh, Gong Renbao, uh, 1947 to 1961, again, is a short life, short life. Uh, Lei Zhen through Free China, uh, Zi Yu Zhongguo, 1949 to 1960. Again, he was put in jail the, as, a, as a result. And Peng Mingming, Professor Peng Mingming and his the three students via open declaration on Taiwan's people's self, self safe, Zi Jiu, Taiwan Renmin Zi Jiu, 1964, and Taiwan Presbyterian Church via open declaration on national affairs statement, 1971, and human rights declaration, 1977. Let me just add the Taiwan Presbyterian Church. It was one of the very few religious organizations that has made a tremendous important contribution to Taiwan democracy. Uh, besides this uh, Presbyterian Church, other religious groups are very limited role to play uh, for Taiwan's democratization. Next page. Uh, Tangwai, next page. Tangwai opposition books and Danwai Opposition Magazine in 1970, the third, the third outlet. The mushrooming growth of political intellectual books and magazine were published, published by uh, Taiwan, the Taiwanese liberal intellectuals and political activists. Um, 
from the outside KMT circle, so-called Dang Wai, criticizing the current KMT authoritarian control, advocating democratic reform, and proposing the political future of Taiwan. Number four, that the fourth outlet is grassroots civil society movement in 1980s. Three waves, 1980 to 1986. 1980s, 1987, the particular year, and 1988 to 1990, of social reform, social movement were initiated and organized by many liberal new middle class professionals and intellectuals through their independent civil society organizations began as early as 1980s by Consumer Foundation for Consumers' Rights Movement. And I'm happy to be, to be part of this uh, consumer movement, followed by a very wide range of social movement on the in environment, gender, students, indigenous, religion, human rights, anti-nuclear, labor, farmers, welfare, housing, free journalism, and judicial reform. And this, because of this, uh, uh, social movement that really, again, mobilized the, the general public to be more aware of the issues facing Taiwan socially and politically. Um, I'm asked, I'm here to speak to specificity on the number three, the Tangwei Opposition uh, magazine. So let's turn to the next page. Uh, from, the, uh, from the table, uh, the important Tangwei Opposition magazine in 1975 to Formosa incidents, the Melida of 1979. I will call it the first phase of the opposition move of the opposition magazines. You can see there are the seven typical or important uh, magazines from Taiwan Political Review, Taiwan Zheng Lun, to Xia Chao, the China, the China Tai, to this generation, the 80s. For Mosa magazine, drumming song and spring wind. You can see from this, uh, mostly of the 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 key the key person who are the publishers are politicians, are activists, activists. Most of our activists and politicians. Again, the issues published are very few, only ranging from even from one issue to thirty five issues. And Xia Chao. Um, was never being suspended, and Taiwan Zhengren was suspended and eventually banned. Um, so those are the uh, 1975 to uh, 1979, uh, this, uh, this public, important publications. Uh, you can see the authors of these magazines. Who are the authors? Are the authors mainly the activists? politicians and young activists, intellectuals, uh, most of them were at that time PhD students. Very few academic and or professors in established professor in established university would contribute articles because that time uh, the political uh, climate doesn't allow, does not permit the uh, professors and to, to, to write articles. Even they, even they did write from time to time. Very uh, occasionally, they used they were used the pen name. But again, the authorship is very important uh, by activists and politicians. Uh, those are the 1975 to 1979 Taiwan magazine. I'm happy to say that uh, uh, within the George George Washington University's uh, collection, uh, some of the, the magazine here. Uh, you can see it now. You can see the next 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 one is important. Down why opposition magazine groups in 1979 to 1989, and to be noted again, 1987 July 15 was the day to lift the martial law, and so that was a very critical moment to uh, to separate the two faiths. And and this here, you I like to. Uh, Emphasize why it's called groups. During the first phase, when a magazine, the issue was was uh, suspended, and then this is this is at the end of a magazine publications. But since the day 1970 and 80s, and the, those publishers, those activists knew the way, find found the way 
to deal with this suspension. So they call the groups. That means what? They they are prepared. Well, they are they were prepared to be suspended uh, from if their magazine was suspended, and they will come up with a new ish, new magazine name, and so we call the groups. So, for example, the eighties groups. So they even published Asia Asian Yazhou Ren magazine and the current magazine, and the Formosa uh, Island groups. They have the not only the Peng Lai Dao, but they have the Zhongbu Lou, Bell Drum Tower, Drum Gong, and the Fabulous Island, Fabulous Island, and Fabulous Island. And they will use different Chinese names. So you can see uh, this is the way to deal with uh, this uh, suspension. So uh, you can do uh, the, the statement groups, and also the Democrats and Democratic politics. Next page. And the cultivate, the cultivate groups, they have a Taiwan Weekly. They use the most of the uh, use Taiwan, and they have a Shenzhen Taiwan Nianzai, Taiwan Guangchang, Taiwan Chaoliu, Taiwan Zhangwang, and Shenzhen. And so you can see most of the magazines here also suspended many times, but then it's okay, and they will produce, they will publish a new magazine under a different name. At the same groups, same same editors, same publishers. So you can see the progress time groups. They have a progress square, progress error, progress world, and progress weekly and looking forward. And this table you can see. And the last one uh, is the called the freedom era groups. And I think the George Washington GW collection has a uh, quite a few issues. Uh, it has that has been digitized, which is very good. And uh, that is a Zhen Nanrong, uh, Zhen Nanrong, famous Zhen Nanrong uh, published. And they published 302 issues. And they, they, they these groups, the magazine has uh, suspended 42 times. So they were just suspended and then they published a new magazine and then suspended and another magazine. So this group is a very interesting uh interesting to 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 be aware uh, so therefore don't be uh, confused by so many magazines actually there are we should be aware there are a few uh, limited uh, a few uh, uh groups number a is a movement group Liu, which later turned into the new uh, the the new tide uh, Liu, uh faction within dpp uh, so that's are the uh the the, the magazines uh, the groups Okay, let me turn to the next one. The, let me tell, tell you a, a little bit about the role of the Wei opposition magazine in retrospect. Between 1975 and July 1987, when the martial law was lifted, the Wei opposition ma magazines, along with the mushrooming growth of the many civil society movement organizations, have been serving the dual function of the enlightenment and mobilization during the initial years of Taiwan's political liberalization and democratization. The series of magazine and the diverse of reform issue oriented social movement organizations were the two additional viable mechanisms besides the Danwai opposition activists and their movement in facilitating and pro promoting public awareness of the consciousness toward the Taiwan democratic transformation in the period of 12 years of 1975 and 1987. It is important to note that the formal opposition party, Democratic Progressive Party, DPP, was illegally self-organized on September 28, 1986. The ban of the free press was lifted on January 1st, 1988 while the ban on free formation of a political party was lifted on January 1st, 1990. So you can see the magazine play the dual role enlightenment and mobilization role before the martial law was lifted. Therefore, it was a sort of, sort of a serving as a pioneering force for Taiwan's uh, democratization. Let me talk about the, on the enlightenment role. First, educating the readers 
of democratic ideals and human rights values. Let me add it. I am. I was the regular uh, a, a reader, mostly in my role during the 1970 and 80s as a graduate, as a student. I was a curious reader of the, those magazines. Later, after 1979, I returned to Taiwan, become a, a young sociology, and then from time to time, occasionally, I will contribute uh, a, a, my article to those opposition magazine, sometimes with pen name, sometimes with real name. But I, don't, I did not write about the specific political issue. I wrote about environmental movement, social movement, and uh, uh, ethnic issues and uh, on the uh, general social movement issues. So they say it was uh, important for the public to be aware of. The familiarizing the public about Taiwan democratic goal. How, why? Why we need the lift martial law? Why freedom formation of a political party was important? Free press was so crucial. Overall parliamentary reform, nationalization of the army, popular election of the provincial governor, and city mayor, which at that time was not for popular election and freedom of speech and so on and so forth. Number three, informing the readers of the true face of KMT's authoritarian rule and the Jiang family autocracy. There are many, many myths about this uh, KMT's rule and about the Jiang family and those through the magazine, they'll tell you what is the true face, faces. Number four, debunking myth and lies at the education and re-education of Taiwan's past and present, which the first time, but number five is rebuilding Taiwan's historical viewpoint and beginning to address the issue of the look at the history from Taiwanese perspective and Taiwan history, Taiwan society, Taiwan politics should be understood of, for his own right and of his own right. Number six is in, inspiring the readers to de, determine and control Taiwan's political identity, uh, that's a destiny and future. On the mobilization, mobilization role, number one is the public, publicizing the ongoing Taiwan opposition activists, ideas, and values. Number two. Michael, just Michael. One, one minute, please. Okay, sure. all right, thank you. Sorry, and next sorry. Page. Okay, sorry. I'm, fin I'm finishing now. Uh, okay. Next page. Number two, uh, publicizing uh, uh, the ongoing Dangwei opposition activities that the people know why Dangwei was organized, were organized, and what for, for what purposes. And sharing with the concerned citizens about the conflicting opposition strategies. For example, within the system of strategy, that means parliamentarian election strategy versus outside system called mass mobilization movement. Number three, so that people can know how and through what perspective, through what, what way that we can um, begin Taiwan's democratization. Number three is generating the public understanding and support for Dangwei opposition movement and their election campaigns. Number four, recruiting and training the young talents for the Dangwei opposition movement and their election campaigns. This is very important to really recruit a lot of concerned young activists into this magazine editing, writing, interviewing work, and, and so on and so forth. Number five is providing important materials and facts to the concerned liberal professors and intellectuals to be more informed and more involved in rendering their sympathy and support of the Dangwei opposition movement. I think this is very important there. That's why 19, since 1980 and 90s, more and more liberal professors are uh, become more sympathetic and supportive of the democracy democracy movement and become more and more supportive of the DPP. Okay, in conclusion, the Dangwai Opposition Magazine, along with the civil society movement organizations, were crucial and indispensable 
to the early phase of the Taiwan liberalization and democratization in the 1970s and 80s. The existence and development of a Danwai opposition magazine cannot be viewed sheerly as being instrumental to the progress of a Danwai opposition movement. They had their own values and merit of themselves. Moreover, despite the existed some ideological and strategic difference among the magazines during that time, they had tried hard to build a unified front in targeting against the authoritarian KMT regime for the overall goal of Taiwan's democratic struggle. So let me to end the one more per, per, per sentence. I think the, the opposition magazine uh, was serving was a, was a was a very was a key instrument was a key way to um, for the Taiwan's early phase of democratization and followed by the mass social movement strategy. And the third is a party politics. So if we want to understand. The early phase of Taiwan democracy. I think the, those magazine research, magazine study, detailed study of magazine are uh, very important. Followed by the social movement studies. Okay, I'll, I'll end here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael, for that uh, terrific retrospective on to uh, the early part of Taiwan's democratic movement. And I think it's a perfect opening for Karis who will now take us through Taiwan and Hong Kong. So, Karis, over to you. Great. Um, thanks, Deepa. And uh, it's it's my pleasure to join this distinguished group. Um, I should begin with a caveat. I feel like a bit of an imposter here talking about Hong Kong with our esteemed discussant Shirley Lin on the line. Um, she's far more knowledgeable and informed about that place than I am. Uh, and so I thought I would just try to place Hong Kong in a broader comparative and historical perspective uh, in this presentation. Of the three cases we've talked about or we're talking about today, uh, Taiwan, Myanmar, and Hong Kong, Hong Kong has probably gotten the most attention in the United States in recent months and years. Um, in particular, uh, there's a New York Times piece today, uh, kind of a deep uh, dive into the uh, efforts by Beijing to push back against the democracy movement and to crack down uh, on uh, the effort to liberalize Hong Kong there. Uh, I recommend you read that piece. Uh, it's very well done. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to start off by noting before I dive in is that in listening to Dr. Xiao's presentation, it, it's striking just how different communication technology is now, right? Um, the idea that these uh, Donghuai magazines were just critically important ways for the opposition in Taiwan in the 70s and 80s to organize uh, seems quite, it seems almost quaint to us now, where you can text people things and have a huge crowd organized in a matter of minutes in different parts of Hong Kong. And that's an activity that the Hong Kong protesters were actually quite successful at doing. Um, and in a sense, that gives uh, democracy movements some new tools, some better tools to challenge authoritarian governments. Um, and so uh, if I leave you with nothing else today, I want to um, I want to hit the point that the Hong Kong democracy movement, I don't think uh, failed. I think they succeeded up to the point where Beijing had to intervene forcefully to push back. And it's only with Beijing's intervention that the uh, democracy movement in Hong Kong has lost ground. Um, so I wanted to kind of put these uh, events in Hong Kong in some historical perspective and just um, some of our audience probably knows this already, but just to remind those who do and, and to, um, to try to uh, give us some common ground for discussion here. So timeline of events in Hong Kong, why is there a need for a democracy movement in Hong Kong? Well, uh, Hong Kong until 1997 was a UK colony. Uh, there was a joint declaration on the future of Hong Kong signed and ratified in 1984 and five, returning it to the control of the PRC. Uh, that handover took place in 1997, uh, and it took place under the terms of a one country, two systems arrangement, whereby Hong Kong would have a high degree of autonomy for 50 years, or it was promised that, and it was supposed to uh, be able to maintain its own legal and economic and political system for those 50 years. Uh, next slide. Um, 
uh, and um, that continued uh, until about 2003 with the handover, um, until uh, the Hong Kong government attempted to impose a national security law that would allow uh, the regime to uh, to intervene in judicial independence for one and to arrest uh, people that they saw as a threat to national security. This was an issue that was pushed by Beijing and this sparked the first of many protests in Hong Kong against uh, uh, kind of illiberal tendencies in the government. So the Hong Kong government faced uh, massive protests, hundreds of thousands of people came out into the street uh, and the government eventually backed down in the face of these protests. Uh, and so we got to return to effectively the one country, two system status quo. Next slide. Um, the key question and the real issue that drives the democracy movement in Hong Kong uh, is the question of whether and how the government should be chosen. Uh, under the basic law, uh, Hong Kong people were promised uh, the direct election of their chief executive and their legislature via free elections uh, using universal suffrage. Um, but after 1997 and the handover, half of the Legislative Council or LegCo was indirectly elected from functional constituencies. And the chief executive uh, was picked by an electoral college, mostly controlled by Hong Kong tycoons and uh, people very close to Beijing. Uh, and so uh, really ever since 1997, there's been a big split, a big cleavage within the Hong Kong political system between the pro-democracy camp, which is pushing for uh, a system that lives up to this promise of full, free and fair elections uh, and a kind of pro-Beijing or pro-authoritarian camp uh, that has resisted those, change, those uh, reforms. Next slide. Um, by 2007, the democracy movement uh, managed to uh, win a promise from Beijing um, that uh, it would eventually approve some kind of direct election. It would actually fulfill the pledges that were made in the uh, one country, two systems basic law, uh, and that it would approve direct elections by 2016 for the LegCo and 2017 for the chief executive. Uh, next, uh, and in particular, they promised that uh, the both bodies would be elected by implementing the method of uh, election of, by members by universal suffrage. Next slide. Um, in 2014, Beijing reneged on that commitment. Uh, the National People's Congress Standing Committee proposed direct election of both bodies, but um, as people suspected, they also proposed a nomination committee that would screen out any candidates unacceptable to the CPP, uh, CCP. And as a result, you've got massive protests that erupted again. The Occupy uh, Central movement broke out. Um, this kind of morphed into something broader called the Umbrella Movement. And again, uh, with millions of protesters in the street, uh, the Hong Kong government backed down and this electoral reform was ultimately not adopted. So the status quo remained again. Next slide. Uh, and then uh, for the last five years, up until 2019, there was basically a stalemate. You had no new electoral reform, so no new concessions from Beijing or from the Hong Kong government, but the pro-democracy movement was in some sense emboldened. Uh, there was a localist camp that emerged promoting greater Hong Kong autonomy or even Hong Kong independence. Um, and at the same time, the Hong Kong government was no more responsive to the wishes of the majority in Hong Kong than it had been before. So the 2017 chief executive election featured candidates screened by Beijing and allowed to run. Uh, and the Beijing favored candidate, Carrie Lam, was selected uh, by this electoral college of less than 2,000 people over John Tsang, despite Tsang's greater popularity in the polls. Next slide. Uh, and then in 2019, the Hong Kong government proposed uh, an extradition law. Uh, this was actually, uh, ironically, triggered by an event that took place in Taiwan, where uh, Taiwan wanted to bring uh, a Hong Kong resident who had who was alleged to have committed a murder there back uh, to Taiwan. Um, and this proposal triggered massive protests in Hong Kong again, more broadly supported uh, this time around than the 2014 protests because they threatened Hong Kong's 
uh, judicial independence uh, for a broad swath of the Hong Kong electorate. Uh, the idea that Beijing could um, extradite people from Hong Kong to the mainland meant that the judicial independence and the extra guarantees of due process in Hong Kong uh, were no longer, they would be significantly eroded by this extradition law. Uh, and as a result, we had kind of a vicious cycle where police and protesters engaged in increasingly violent street battles throughout the summer and fall of 2019. Um, this continued uh, really until uh, early 2020. Uh, Beijing waited to impose uh, a real crackdown on protesters until after the 2020 Taiwan presidential election in January, uh, but then it rolled out um, uh, a new draconian national security law uh, without even attempting to go through the Hong Kong legislature. This was just imposed by the National People's Congress. Uh, next slide. Um, and uh, it, there were not tanks rolling into Hong Kong. There were not uh, military forces in the streets. Um, so this, this crackdown was executed in part through existing Hong Kong institutions, but it's been used to justify the arrests of any uh, a wide swath of the pro-democracy protest leaders and candidates. Uh, and just in recent days, we've seen the shutdown of uh, some of the most critical and independent media in Hong Kong, including Apple Daily, the largest uh, independent uh, and most Beijing critical newspaper in Taiwan, in Hong Kong. Um, just within the last 24 hours, there have been uh, shutdowns of programs on uh, RTHK, a radio station in Hong Kong. Uh, and so I would argue now one country, two systems looks increasingly dead. Um, the democracy movement uh, has been unable to push back against this uh, overt pressure from Beijing, overt intervention in, uh, in the special administrative region of Hong Kong. Okay, next slide. Um, so when we look at Hong Kong in comparison to Taiwan, Michael uh, has just laid out um, a, a bit of the, the pro-democracy movement's efforts in the 70s and 80s in Taiwan. To me, as someone who's a Taiwan expert, I, watching the Hong Kong democracy movement has felt a lot like watching Taiwan in the 1970s and 80s, but the tape is running backwards. Uh, in both cases, the crucial issue is about direct elections, about the people's right to be able to choose who runs the government, uh, who's eligible to run, who's eligible to vote, and whether certain views are screened out as illegitimate. In the Taiwan case, Taiwan independence was off limits for a long time as a point of discussion. In the Hong Kong case, the idea that Hong Kong uh, should be able to uh, declare independence if it wanted, that, that is a, a view that's out of bounds for Beijing. Um, Politically, Hong Kong, in my mind, in 2007, started about where Taiwan was circa 1990, but it's been going backwards. Uh, and it's now, unfortunately, at about Taiwan circa 1975, where the leadership, the government of Hong Kong, uh, has no qualms about just rounding up um, members of the opposition who are problems uh, and simply finding an excuse to throw them in jail. And so I've got the, the Taiwan Dong Wai uh, members uh, at the bottom here, we were rounded up in 1980 and thrown in jail. Um, we've got, unfortunately, I think the, the Hong Kong version of that is uh, is Joshua Wong and Agnes Cho, uh, who are both now um, uh, detained in Hong Kong. Next slide. Um, so uh, in the last couple of minutes here, I want to just uh, speculate a bit about why Taiwan's pro-democracy movement really succeeded over the 70s and 80s. Long process, but really did move things eventually in the direction of liberal democracy uh, and why Hong Kong has, has ultimately failed to do that. I think a uh, big part of this uh, explanation rests on the regime ideology of the Republic of China on Taiwan. This was supposed to be democratic China, and that meant that the regime pledged and said in its own propaganda that it would hold real and meaningful elections. Uh, next. Um, the KMT regime in the 70s and 80s was also losing a lot of international legitimacy. Uh, it had been de-recognized by uh, the United States by 1979, had very few partners and allies around the world by the early 1980s. So it was a very vulnerable regime, both domestically and internationally by the 1980s, and much more susceptible then to opposition protests and a pro-democracy movement. And then 
the most important factor, I think, is the U.S. had a lot of sway in Taiwan. Taiwan was very dependent on U.S. backing, even in the 1980s, and vulnerable to outside pressure. And so the declaration that martial law was eventually going to be lifted, uh, Jiang Jingwo, the then leader of Taiwan, made this declaration to, of all people, the publisher of the Washington Post, who was on a visit to Taiwan. She gets an exclusive interview with him. Um, and uh, Jiang Jingwo states that he's going to lift martial law and will not crack down on the opposition uh, that's been formed at that time. Um, it's hard to imagine Xi Jinping sitting down with a reporter or a publisher from somewhere in the West and saying, you know, I'm going to allow the pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong to continue. Uh, and so that should be an indication of how much greater influence the U.S. had in Taiwan than the United States or the West does over Beijing today. Next. Okay. Um, Hong Kong's movement is operating in a much more difficult international environment than Taiwan's was in the 1980s. Next. Uh, mass protests in Hong Kong, I think, matter a lot less now uh, than CCP attitudes in Beijing. Next. Uh, the U.S. and other Western powers have pretty limited influence over Beijing. Uh, it's less about what happens in Hong Kong than what happens in Beijing. And China, under Xi Jinping, unfortunately, has become a lot more politically authoritarian and illiberal uh, over the last 15 years. If you compare 2007 uh, to 2014, in 2007, the leadership in Beijing was still willing to consider concessions on the right to uh, allow Hong Kong people to elect their own leaders. Any independent spaces outside the CCP anywhere in the PRC now are just intolerable. Um, the, under Xi Jinping, the regime has systematically tried to crack down and eliminate these independent spaces. Uh, next. Uh, and so finally, uh, and this is the last bit, uh, Xi Jinping, I think, is willing to take the hit to the PRC image and credibility on, among other places, Taiwan, to impose more direct CCP control over Hong Kong. And so I think, uh, despite the best efforts of the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong, uh, it's really a different game now, and it relies, it's going to require uh, political changes in Beijing, I think, for Hong Kong to uh, be able to advance uh, a more liberal uh, political uh, agenda. Um, and with that, I will close my formal remarks, and I look forward to hearing from the rest. Thank you so much, Karis, for that deft discussion of the political dynamics in uh, Hong Kong. And uh, I think your proposition about where Hong Kong is today in comparison to the democracy movement in Taiwan is probably going to generate some uh, discussion. Um, so I look forward to that. And also a note to the audience, please feel free to start putting your Q, uh, questions into the Q&A box uh, throughout the event. All right. All right. Now, back to, all the way to Myanmar from Christina and see where things are at and any comparative thoughts you have. Christina. Thank, thank you so much, Deepa. So I'll focus on the current spring revolution in Myanmar, and I'm happy to answer questions about earlier protests in Myanmar in the Q&A. But first, I'd like to point out some of the differences in the situation in Myanmar compared to Taiwan and Hong Kong. So the first is that there are two overlapping struggles in Myanmar. Next slide, please. One is for democracy, but the other one is for federalism. And since Myanmar's independence in 1948, there have been ethnic armed groups who have been operating in the mountainous areas that ring the plains of central Myanmar and have been fighting for autonomy in their areas. So we have these two dynamics of nonviolent struggle during the period of military rule from 1962 until 2011, and then since the coup this year, um, but also armed struggle in the ethnic nationality areas for autonomy or a system of federalism. Next slide, please. So the 2010s were a period of dramatic, if partial change. The military regime actually allowed for a hybrid system of government to come into existence in which the military would share power with a civilian elected government. However, their intention was for a military backed party to win those elections and share power with them in order for them to continue to have extensive political influence. 
That said, the first elected government, which was mostly ex-military people, made a number of changes in a democratic direction. And I think that was largely because of the impact of being elected. They weren't free and fair elections, which is why they won, but they felt that they had to prove themselves to citizens. And in the ensuing years, more democratic parties won those elections. And citizens saw both economic opportunities open up, but also government investing in their well being, improving health care, education, communications, uh, providing more roads, um, and many other things, electricity, et cetera. And so when the military staged a coup in February 2021, people felt that the rug had been pulled out from underneath them. They were angry both that the government that they had elected, which had won a landslide victory in November 2020, had been taken away, and that their right to choose their government had been taken away from them. And for younger people, there was a feeling that they had grown up with more freedoms and they had more confidence and tech ability, tech savvy. Um, they felt like they had to organize and do something. But also for older people, they felt that they couldn't go back to the dark years that they had experienced before the 2010s. And so they too joined protests in their own ways. And really there was a sense in the country, or there still is a sense today, that this has to be the last struggle. This time, the military has to be removed from political power once and for all. Next slide. So Generation Z, uh, they were the first to come out and, and really lead resistance against the military coup. And what they tried to do was to create what they called a spring revolution, which meant getting rid of military rule once and for all, no more hybrid governance, um, but also something that was hopeful. So they used the term spring to indicate that this is a hopeful, positive experience, not a kind of bloody revolution, although that's how it's turned out to be. Um, so they tried to make the protests very easy for people to participate in. They tried to really pull in people who might not be that politically committed uh, by making it very fun and very light. So on the left-hand side, you can see that one day they organized protests where people brought inflatable pools out into the street and sat in those. Another day they had people come out in ball gowns. Um, other days, they had people come out in traditional clothes. There were bodybuilders who came out in protest. There were break dancers who came out and protested. So it had a very light feeling. And they were able to organize this nationwide because they had a basically leaderless movement where there were numerous people in every city and town around the country who were connecting over Zoom calls, WhatsApp, et cetera, at night to plan the activities for the next day. And it was very difficult for the military leadership, at least initially, to figure out who were really the key organizers. But as the military saw these protests growing in size, they cracked down on the demonstrators, and demonstrators had to uh, you know, invest in other types of means to keep the struggle going. So uh, just to go back to the last slide for a second, protesters started painting huge signs in the street, such as we want democracy, save Myanmar, and other places where people uh, in the ethnic areas, they also wrote, we want federalism or federal democracy. Next slide. Um, but also to try to deter the, the security forces as they came after them on the streets, they hung longis or sarongs in the streets because Men in Myanmar feel that to go underneath a woman's longi is to be drained of your power and virility. So this was something that slowed down the security forces for a while because they really did not want to go under those longis and they had to cut them down before they would continue down the street. We can also see on the right hand side side in the bottom uh, the degree to which the movement had access to money and materials. So they were able to get hard hats. They were able to get goggles so that they could resist the tear gas. Um, they had shields sometimes and a lot of types of equipment that enabled them to continue their struggle even when things got violent. But the military started not only trying to arrest the demonstrators themselves, but they just started shooting randomly at people who were bystanders, even people in houses along the way, 
And this did have a, a chilling effect on the demonstrators. So the large demonstrations uh, that lasted hours at a time came to an end and organizers tried to do flash demonstrations where they could and use other means such as art and protests on social media to communicate their resistance. Um, one thing they did on Easter, for instance, was they had people paint Easter eggs and put them out in different places in public, which you can see at the top of the slide. Next slide, please. So along with Gen Z, who was mostly out on the streets, um, there was also a civil disobedience movement, and this was comprised of both government workers and private sector worker workers who stopped working in order to say that we will not help to keep this military regime in power. So for instance, something like two thirds of health personnel around the country stopped working in hospitals and clinics. Teachers and professors refused to go to work. People working in the central bank, diplomats, railway workers, port workers, people of all kinds stopped working. And many of them came out in the streets. Others of them stayed home, but they refused to uh, participate in the state workplace. Also in the private sector, people working in banks stopped going to banks. They wanted to basically shut down the economy so that the regime couldn't survive. And factory workers also came out on the streets and asked that international companies that are buying uh, garments from Myanmar would make sure that their uh, employers would let them come back to work despite participating in these protests. At the same time, older people and housewives and others who were in their homes protested at night, every night at 8 p.m. by banging on pots and pans. So and that was another way to protest in a way that was safe. You couldn't be seen, um, but able, but be able to participate in this bigger movement. Next slide. At the same time, armed struggle was one of the methods, or is one of the methods that is being used to resist the military coup. And the actors who are involved include the ethnic armed groups who've been fighting for decades. And they've taken advantage of this moment to reclaim territory that they used to control, but had lost to the Myanmar military. But also there are Gen Z people and people from the civil disobedience movement in the thousands who have fled to ethnic armed group areas. And in some cases across the border into neighboring countries. And some of them have gotten military training from the ethnic armed organizations, as you can see on the right. And then they have gone back into central Myanmar to fight against the military regime. And this has been supported by elected people from the government that was elected in 2020. Many of the people who were elected were arrested on the day of the coup or in the subsequent weeks. But there were a number of people who were able to flee to the ethnic armed organization areas or outside the country, and they formed a parallel government. And after the military became increasingly brutal in its tactics, and the international community did not intervene, intervene in any kind of meaningful way, the national unity government, the parallel government, basically told people, we sanction you taking up arms and defending yourself. And what this has led to is people's defense forces all over the country. So Gen Z people were originally saying nonviolent struggle is what we're all about, but now many of them have taken up weapons and have been attacking security personnel in some areas, but also assassinating local administrators who are willing to work with the regime in other places. Next slide. Social media has been key, uh, just as it has been in Hong Kong, um, and Gen Z in particular has been very adept at using social media. This has been important both in organizing the movement but also communicating to people around the country what's going on to show that the movement is alive everywhere. And so this is a post on the left that's just from a couple of days ago from a village in central Myanmar where people are still organizing and protesting against the regime despite the risks. And AAPP, an association of former political prisoners, has been collecting data from citizen journalists who've been reporting on social media and sending them directly information about the abuses committed by the military and they've been trying to triangulate that information and then publish that and this has been picked up by international media 
and is also being collected to be used in international criminal trials in the future, if that's possible. Uh, next slide. Actually, before I talk about the regime response, I just wanted to talk about one other way that social media has been used by Generation Z. They have also engaged in what they call social punishment. What this means is that they out or dox people from the military or people who have agreed to work with the military regime by publishing their name, their address, uh, other information about them, uh, by attacking them uh, verbally over social media, and in some cases also talking about their children, who they are, where they are, what they're doing, and in some cases threatening their children as well. So this has been an aspect of the uh, movement that I think uh, some people agree with and some people disagree with, but it's, it's something that Generation Z has adopted as a way to try to deal with the fact that if they can't um, bring down the regime directly, at least they're going to try to attack them through social media. Next slide. The regime's response has been to basically try to cut the movement's access to uh, money, uh, to material goods, um, but especially to information. And so that's been by cutting off the internet at night, uh, but also through arresting journalists, as in Hong Kong, um, basically shutting down all independent media in the country and ramping up its use of state media. And there's also military run media in Myanmar. So the Global New Light of Myanmar is a publication that's put out by the state. And I think that this title gives you a sense of how, how the regime sees its role, which is serving the interests of the state. Um, and the state is really uh, a moniker for the military and why people are opposed to military rule because they don't want uh, to be serving the interests of the state. They want the state to be serving their interests. Next slide. So in conclusion, uh, the sacrifices that people in the movement have made have been enormous, and that it ranges from everything from economic to loss of life, uh, separation from family, um, and internally displaced people in many parts of the country. But I think the adaptability and the resilience of the movement, the strength of the movement to go on despite these conditions is astounding, and it reflects, again, the sense that we cannot go back to the dark ages again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina, for that riveting presentation about what's going on in uh, Myanmar and perhaps slightly more hopeful, I think, than Karis's presentation on Hong Kong. But to bring it all together for us, uh, a very I've given Dr. Lin a very tough task, but she's more than up to it. And so without further ado, Shirley, Thank you, Deepa. Can you hear me? Yes. Can yes. you hear me? Okay, great. Um, I had some sound issues. Well, I'm so honored, um, Deepa, to be a discussant today because Sigur Center and the Elliott School are dear to me and my husband, Harry Harding. And the work Deepa has done built on previous work done by Ed McCor, now Richard Haddock, and many others who made it possible to have a university based Taiwan studies program. And now with a collection of rare Danwai material. Having lived in Hong Kong and Taiwan for the last 15 months with many friends and students working with Myanmar groups, today's excellent presentations gave me a chance to reflect on how all we are all connected. The opposition movement is a large part of my upbringing and identity. Hearing Michael speak about it brings back memories of three stories I'd like to share with you. Growing up near Taipei 101 when I was in fifth grade in 1977, I had a birthday party with my classmates. And I share the story of 228 in 1947, which I heard from my parents, but my friends were in disbelief because they had never heard of it and said, I must be lying. Of course, this is Taipei City, not the South. So it was natural. My parents were very big supporters of the democracy movement. And after the 1979 Kaohsiung incident, my father designed posters and made copies in stores in the days before copy machines were easily accessible and using them was very risky. At night, my mom would take me and my sisters to put those posters supporting those arrested and put them up on the streets on electricity posters around the block. Mm. Holes. I still remember how scared I was when teachers in school asked if anybody had Meili Dao magazines at home, and if so, they must be turned in. In effect, they were asking us to report our parents. 
A few years later at Harvard, I met Ling Yixiong, whose Chiling Foundation is a sponsor of today's donation of Donghui literature, and Annette Liu. And it was just as inspiring as when I met Aung San Suu Kyi in San Francisco in 2013 through the Asia Foundation. I started the Taiwanese Cultural Society at Harvard in 1986, which only sought to polish our Hokkien language skills. Because I'm part Hakka, my Hokkien was very bad. And the authoritarian Taiwanese government rep office in Boston immediately called me to warn me about organizing students. In Boston, nothing was trivial to an oppressive regime. My point is that the fear and despair we all felt never seemed likely to have a happy ending, but we persisted as in the people. And my feeling is that there was not, there was only support for the KMT regime and substantive opposition to Taiwan's democracy. But still, the Taiwanese persisted in their pursuit of democracy. Today, Hong Kong may be under the rule of a rising China, as Kairos has pointed out, but there is much more sympathy around the world for democratic movements in Hong Kong and Myanmar than for democratic movements in Taiwan during the Cold War, when it was not poli the political mainstream to support the Dong Wai movement. After the handover in Hong Kong, I took my daughters with me often to demonstrations and protests in Victoria Park as they were growing up and told them stories of the difficulties in Taiwan when I was a child. I feel that my children, my students, and my colleagues in Hong Kong all want and deserve more, and they are coming to terms with what it means to be a Hong Kongner. As Myanmar shows, democracy, after all, is a journey, and you never fully arrive and can never be complacent. Illiberal tendencies recur, just like variants of the COVID-19 pandemic. Teaching part of the year at the university, which Thomas Jefferson founded, backsliding in the United States has been an important lesson for us all, especially in Charlottesville. Taiwan's democracy is also not perfect. It is still a work in progress. Democracy may be one step forward, two steps back, but one never actually reaches full democracy. It is a process where you cultivate support among people for universal and progressive democratic values, and then on that basis, build effective and durable democratic institutions. I totally agree with Michael's argument that the Don Wai journals played a major role in developing and promoting those values, and this underscores the importance of Apple Daily and other print media, which provide a platform for discussion. Today, younger people in Myanmar and Hong Kong have something important in common, which is they are seeking to recover or restore something that has been taken away, as reflected in the main slogan of the democracy movement in Hong Kong, Guangfu Xianggang, which I think is poorly translated as liberate. It is to recover. This is the main difference with Taiwan, because Taiwanese and most of Asia never have full democracy in those 40 years in the dark. So the Taiwanese were pioneers without a map as to where they were going. Every people get the government they deserve. And I think that this panel raises more questions rather than answers, which I like to pursue in my two questions to the panelists, whom I'm hoping to learn from. So um, on that note, could I start with my first question, um, which is a focus on what Christina pointed out, the generational shifts. All of you talked about um, the younger generation, the older generation. Well, I'm in the older generation, I suppose, by having told some stories. But what do you think the generational difference is between the older generation and Gen Z um, in terms of their views on democratization in 2021? Michael, do you think the Dawai movement was supported by mainly young people in the first few decades of KMT rule as opposed to by older people? Or is there a cohort effect as opposed to generational effect? Can violence and suppression be so effective that it can permanently silence an entire generation of protesters, young and old? Or conversely, will those who participated in a powerful democracy uh, movement remain committed to democracy throughout their lives? Um, maybe we can go a bit reverse from Christina uh, and then Karis and then Michael, um, two minutes each. Thank you so much, Shirley. I appreciate your question. Um, I think, you know, Myanmar is so interesting because in this case, in this movement, we really see people of all ages, all generations, all classes who have come together. And we see that across ethnic Bama, 
in the heartland, but also ethnic minorities in the ethnic states. And uh, perhaps what's interesting in Myanmar are two things. Number one, in 1988, for instance, which was the last time there were broad based uh, demonstrations, there was participation from older people as well, but it was much more short lived. It was really the students who carried it forward, the students who then went out to the jungle, tried to keep the movement going and come back to the extent that they could. Whereas this time we see the role of civil servants and people in the private sector being so powerful. And really that's what's denying the regime its legitimacy and inability to operate. At the same time, this time we see a much closer relationship between the ethnic minority protesters and people from the Bama majority. And that's in large part because people in the central part of the country have experienced for themselves the violence that the military is willing to commit against them. They didn't believe before that the military was using that kind of brutality against people in the ethnic minority areas and therefore didn't support their struggles for federalism. But now there's a broader understanding about why these people in the ethnic minority areas have been protesting for so long and have been seeking a federal solution. And that's brought people together. So I think that's a positive difference this time around. Thank you very much, Christina. Karis? Uh, Karis, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry. My apologies. Um, you can hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, let me just say quickly on generational differences. Um, I, at least from the Taiwan case, uh, cohort effects are huge relative to generational effects. There's long lasting evidence, and, and Michael can certainly say more about this, uh, of generational differences uh, based on your experience. So if you came of age uh, before 1947 in Taiwan and you witnessed firsthand the crackdown during 228, um, People in that generation went one of two ways. They were cowed into silence and never wanted to talk about it again, or they became deep, deep committed supporters of the independence movement. And that lasted then through the rest of their lives. Um, and I suspect uh, in the Hong Kong case, we have an entire generation of people who came of age, who participated in these protests. I mean, we're talking about millions of people taking to the streets for months on end to participate, that's that's a formative life experience that's not just going to go away. And so uh, my own, again, I'm, I'm kind of projecting out here, but I, I think the PRC has created a long-term problem for themselves, at least the CCP has in Hong Kong. They've created uh, resentment that's generational, that's uh, cohort-wide in Hong Kong, and that's going to last as long as those people are alive. Uh, and so I think there is a real strong generational effect here. Thank you, Karis. Thank you. Michael? Okay. Um, uh, if you look at the leadership of a different phases of the Taiwan democratization, the younger generation always plays some role in leading or participating or pushing uh, the, the, uh, the movement. Um, but if you look at the followership, I think the if you look at the Taiwan's past experiences, I would say the first phase, 1960, 70, and even early 80s, I think ethnicity actually is the driving force behind Taiwan's democratization, Taiwan Ren, you know, the movement, Taiwan Ren, the democracy. The second followed by 1980s by social movement led by the progressive uh, new middle classes. So the class factor took place, emerged, and plus the ethnicity issue. Number three, I think the, the, and when we come to the party politics after 1990s, I think the younger generation plus cohort, especially the 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 millennium. I think the when they come to vote, the first we we often talk about first time voter has become very critical. So I and plus the ethnicity factor still there, the class issue still there. So I would say from ethnicity factor to class plus ethnicity and then to generation 
or cohort class ethnicity and class. So I think at now at this moment at the in Taiwan democracy in entering the party politics or maturing party politics, I think generation, ethnic factor, and class issues are, are intertwined to play in Taiwan's politics. Thank you, Michael. That's great. That leads me to my second question, which if I could just get a, a short response from you, because I know Deepa has many uh, many questions uh, from the audience, um, but it's perfect that you mentioned, Michael, progressive movement. Like with all democratic movements, upholding universal values that are inclusive may have more lasting success than simply achieving regime change. Uh, and Taiwan is still a work in progress. But in the early days, the movement had exclusionary elements as well, excluding Weishenren or Hakka or Aboriginal people. But over time, the movement became more inclusive and progressive, which you personally worked on, such as embracing all ethnicities and minorities like LGBTQT. How did this happen, Michael? And in Hong Kong, there are illiberal tendencies too to exclude non-Cantonese, such as long-term non-Chinese residents, as well as mainland-born immigrants. In Myanmar, the Rohingyas issue and other minorities continue to be important. They're marginalized, which really scar the movement. Uh, Karis and Christina, how do you think about the challenge of fighting an authoritarian regime while also trying to become more pluralistic and progressive? Uh, maybe we start with Michael now. Okay, um, I think it's very important to uh, to be remembered that uh, the 1980s, the the social movement led by diverse groups cross ethnicity. There's the Hakka movement. There is a Aborigines movement. And there is a gender, uh, the women's movement, liberation movement, women movement, and there are the uh, the the mainlander return home movement. So therefore, I will to answer your question. I think yes, I think the 1980s uh, about more than 20, the decade of 1980, more than 20 kind of a diverse social movement really pull all kind of ethnic groups, all kind of a different gender and different ages together. That means the democracy is our common goal. And under democracy, then we can pursue our individual uh, purposes of reform. Thank you, Michael. Um, maybe next, Christina. Thank you. So the military regime that was in power from 62 until 2010, and again now, has always used the creation of an enemy other as a way to bolster its power. And the, the one of the main enemy others for the military has been the Rohingya people, who are a Muslim population on the border between Western Myanmar and Bangladesh. And so under the NLD government in the mid 2010s, there was also pressure on Aung San Suu Kyi to be anti-Rohingya and to support the military's operation to drive the Rohingya out of the country. And what the movement now has to wrestle with is the fact that there are still people in Myanmar who have very negative attitudes about the Rohingya and don't feel that Rohingya are true citizens of the country. And yet, if the movement is really going to be democratic and inclusive, it has to include the Rohingya as well. And this is something that the National Unity Government, the parallel government in particular, has been wrestling with and now has put out a statement saying that they will include the Rohingya in the future. But this isn't something that everybody agrees with in the country, and it's something the military will try to use to chip away at support for the uh, democratic movement. Right. Last but not least. Okay. Right. Um, so again, you're the expert on Hong Kong, not me. So um, I, I'll draw a little bit from the Taiwan case, I think, to, to try to shed some light on this question. Um, there were definitely illiberal or nationalist Taiwanese ex exclusivist tendencies in Taiwan during the democratization movement as well. And uh, the real critical shift that uh, helped Taiwan consolidate democracy was to move from an idea that Ban Shengren were the rightful inheritors of Taiwan, so, so native Taiwanese whose ancestors were there before 49, to the idea that anybody could be Taiwanese as long as you embrace this sort of civic nationalism, this idea that Taiwan, because of its institutions, because of its democracy, its respect for 
uh, the freedom of speech and assembly. Um, anybody, even new immigrants from Southeast Asia could be Taiwanese as long as they embrace those values. And so um, I, uh, I, I'll i leave it to you about whether Hong Kong's democracy movement might be able to make this transition and whether there, there's a, a way to push back against some of the illiberal exclusivist tendencies. But um, I think the Hong Kong example suggests that the way forward is is to focus on the democracy and the liberal part of of uh, Hong Kong's identity rather than the exclusivist nationalist kind of Cantonese based identity. Well, I certainly agree, Carlos, that any kind of uh, uh, illiberal tendencies to exclude is going to diminish uh, the movement. Um, but your presentation was excellent. I really don't have uh, anything to add. Thank you very much. And back to you, Deepa. Thank you so much, Shirley, uh, for that really expert uh, handling of a very a varied set of, to uh, of, of topics and countries. So um, I would like to give you an opportunity to wrap up anything with this uh, conversation before I start taking the questions. Because um, you've already had, fortunately, we don't have a lot of time for questions, but you've asked some of the best questions so far. But any additional thoughts you have? Sure. Uh no, I thought I thought that um, our panelists are just wonderful. But I think to to uh, put it into my perspective, I think Taiwan came first, and as a reason, and I think Horace pointed it out that the external environment is quite different. The Cold War is different than a U.S.-China rivalry. Some could say Cold War, uh, the next stage. But whatever it is, we are in 2021. And if I could just say something uplifting, otherwise a lot of these panels. Uh, make me more depressed. Uh, but I think the uplifting thing is uh, nobody saw light at the end of the tunnel. At least I did not as a child until I graduated from college. Taiwan was not a democracy and everyone thought they were just trying to make a difference without really making any difference. That's how it felt every day all of the time as things went two steps backward oftentimes. And so I think that I see my students in Taiwan and in Hong Kong, uh, young people in Myanmar making such a big difference every day just by being out there talking about ideas, as Michael said, um, really the democracy movement and uh, having ideas alive so people um, appreciate, embrace and find a consensus, uh, I think is uh, is very important. And today, in, um, today the world uh, values freedom more than ever before. Um, and so I, I think that, uh, that that is my what I take away from all the panelists' discussion. Thank you for reminding us of that very important uh, element to keep in mind as we look ahead. Um, and now I'm happy to uh, collect some questions. These and here's one question that I'm going to take uh, brings it's it's related to all three countries and it has to do with the CCP because it is uh, clearly. Chinese Communist Party is deeply enmeshed in all three of these countries in different degrees, to, uh, of course, but it is and it has an influence. And so one, the questionnaire asks uh, the fact that there's going to be a intense power struggle in the next year and a half for Xi Jinping's third term. What do they see as uh, the direction it might take? on the various, uh, on Hong Kong and, and Myanmar, and I suppose on uh, Taiwan as well. That's a big question, but if each of you could uh, jump in, including you, Shirley, uh, and, and give your one minute commentary. Um, let's, uh, let's start with uh, Michael. Uh, the China the, factor. Yes. Yeah, I will go, we, uh, the China factor. Uh, became more become important in Taiwan democratization movement. Of course, a negative factor uh, in the 1990s. Before 1990, the China China factor or China threat was not that obvious. So the before 1990, the Taiwan democracy basically a domestic issue against against KMT. But 1990s and onwards, and more and more so. It to against not only KMT but also CCP, and I think when Taiwan become democratic and the China factor become a threat to Taiwan democracy, and that's why during the Mainzhou period, 19, 2008 and 2016, the the slogan the slogan of Taiwan democracy is to rescue our democracy because uh, Mainzhou was accused for being too lenient 
to PRC to lean into China. So, so again, uh, so that's what I say. Taiwan democracy is still progressing. As uh, Shirley said, that uh, Taiwan is a, a work of progress, but we are we are progressing, but we are under siege, and that source is PRC. Okay, Karis, under siege. Let's yeah. Um, so uh, let me let me talk broadly about authoritarian regimes and stability. I think the the it's easy to overestimate just how stable and how formidable the CCP in China is right now. Uh, and Xi Jinping, by eliminating the term limit, the formal term limit on his time in office, has in a sense reinforced stability in the short run. But by doing that, he's created instability in the long run. And I think uh, succession is the most fundamental weakness in authoritarian regimes, how you how you deal with leadership turnover. Uh, and the CCP after Deng looked like they had created a mechanism to manage succession, to institutionalize it. And she has more or less dismantled that mechanism now. And so uh, while it looks like she is all powerful and uh, able to impose his will, even on a arrestive pro-democracy Hong Kong, uh, what happens if Xi Jinping drops dead of a heart attack tomorrow? I don't know. I don't know at all. And that should worry everybody uh, in the CCP, uh, because ultimately uh, that regime is less stable for what she has done. Um, so, uh, so I'll leave it there. Okay. Um, Christina. Thank you. China and Myanmar. We know it has influence. Indeed. Um, so China, the Chinese government actually was not very happy with the military coup. They had a good relationship with Aung San Suu Kyi and the National League for Democracy, um, which was allowing many of the Belt and Road Initiative projects to go ahead in Myanmar. Um, however, I think that as the months have gone by, they have de decided that it looks likely that the military regime will eventually consolidate power and they better work with them. And the protesters also threatened some of the Chinese projects in Myanmar, which really worried the Chinese government. And so we see that China is playing an active role in basically enabling this regime to consolidate power, particularly by uh, in the Security Council rejecting any proposals from other countries to try to you know, reduce arms coming to Myanmar and provide other support to the democracy movement. So it's been it's made things much more difficult, unfortunately, for the democracy movement to survive. Shirley, any? Yes, Deepa, be quick on my thought. I, I have uh, uh, quite a different take um, uh, than most. I think uh, being under the shadow of China has made Taiwan, of course, uh, very sharp and uh, very on alert all the time. And this is something that's important for all around the world, whether you're Myanmar uh, or Germany. Uh, everybody has a China dilemma, as I always say. And I think that um, the external environment is a threat that unless you're long-term prepared, it can always increase polarization domestically, uh, which is something I see a lot in Taiwan. And of course, uh, China worsens that um, and accentuates it. And I think in the United States, we see that as well. Uh, and so I think that unless uh, long-term challenges are addressed with competent um, uh, people, and that's why it's important to nurture young people with talent to focus on how to govern and to have the right values uh, to in order to face that kind of challenge. Uh, I know that's not much of a short term answer, but the, the, the answer is really like Biden says, build back better uh, instead of focusing on the enemy all the time. Uh, it's always in the background. OK, thank you. I'm going to take the prerogative, if you all don't mind, to extend our event for a few more minutes um, because there's another set of questions that I think are really important, and that has to do with the social media and disinformation. And so this goes to all of the uh, panelists and discussants here, and that is to what extent, um, uh, Christina, has the military regime tried to use disinformation to, um, to curtail the influence of social media that you said is very important? Same thing, Karis. Um, uh, in uh, in Hong Kong, and of course, we know that uh, Taiwan's democracy has been under threat from disinformation from the mainland. So, um, can, can I uh, 
start with uh, uh, Christina, and then we'll. Very sure. Very thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the military regime has used uh, the state media and military media to put out um, daily stories about how it's citizens who are creating problems and it's the regime that's bringing stability to the country. And if it weren't for the security forces, then there wouldn't be stability. There wouldn't be security. Um, in many cases, people don't believe this, though, because they've seen military forces in their own areas who have come into houses and looted people's houses, have dragged people out, et cetera. But their hope is that as independent media is crushed and people hear these stories day after day, and with the fact that you do have an armed civilian you know, movement in different parts of the country, that maybe this kind of ideology will stick and maybe some people at least will feel like, uh, well, the movement itself is a problem. That's their hope. Um, we don't know how it'll go in reality. Okay. Yeah, Harris, could I jump in? Um, yes, um, please do. Sorry. Yes, I, had, I just uh, feel eager to jump in because there is no disinformation in Hong Kong anymore. There's only information that supports one side. So disinformation, I think, is really relevant to democracies like Taiwan, uh, where there's a competing narrative. But in Hong Kong today, basically, um, for those of us involved in academic or in uh, writing uh, publicly, uh, it's it's a very dangerous uh, path, um, and so um, no longer is there an issue of which newspaper do you read. The issue is, do you read um, anything that is published by the propaganda machine, or do you try to uh, look elsewhere? Uh, and I think this is a very big uh, issue in terms of uh, Hong Kong's movement. Okay, Karis and Michael. Yeah. Um... So uh, Shirley has really addressed the Hong Kong issue, I think. I, I can just say something to supplement that, which is that uh, the CCP in China has a different approach to uh, manipulating the information space than, uh, say, uh, Russian agents who are trying to influence the information space. Uh, the CCP still really cares about the actual narrative. Whereas the Russian strategy generally is very nihilist. They're just trying to create divisions uh, and kind of emphasize whatever creates the most controversy among their opponents. Uh, and uh, so in effect, I think the CCP's efforts to influence conversations in Taiwan, at least, have been pretty ineffective, uh, not because they're trying to promote any wild view out there, but because they're trying to promote a particular view that 80 plus percent of Taiwanese are inherently skeptical of. Uh, and so it's uh, it's actually been surprising to me how uh, how difficult it has been for CCP influence campaigns to get traction in the, uh, the media and online space in Taiwan. Um, uh, and uh, the other thing I'd say is that we're in a, in a world that's very different from the 70s and 80s, where the only access to information in Taiwan was these these kind of underground gong wide journals, right? You would pass them around in people's living rooms. Uh, we're in a in a space now where you can get online in Hong Kong still and you know read the New York Times or read whatever other outlets are out there. And so there is a lot of information. So it's much harder for an authoritarian regime to control that information space. Um, and I hope we'll see, uh, but I hope that's the last piece of trying to crack down on on um, civil liberties in Taiwan and or in Hong Kong. And I think uh, it's going to be the most difficult. And I, I suspect the CCP, if it if it pushes that, is going to have a lot of problems in Hong Kong that it hasn't had on the mainland. OK, well, Michael, as the dean of the kind of uh, democracy movement in Taiwan, I'm going to give you the last word. All right, thank you very much. I, I think the uh, disinformation and uh, it was a was a was a big issue, was a big problem during the nine, 2018 when the local election, nine plus one election, and uh, the the disinformation, the sources are coming from within and without, and yeah. that kind of that time, DPP government was not prepared for, for to for it yet. Um, but now after that, I think the Taiwan as a way to deal with the dis disinformation from China is through the social movement again. Uh, 
there are civil society organiz organizations to come out with what we call the news check movement. And they will check the news as they suspect it to be suspected to be disinformation and fake news. They will check tirelessly, tirelessly, and to check the news and publicize it. And it, it was quite effective. And then the government also took the took the steps on the national security level to double check and respond to correct the disinformation and fake news immediately and through various channels. So I think these uh, still a problem uh, we have. We have a problem on, on disinformation and the source come from China. The, why we know the China? Because many, many news from social media on social media are the simple simplified characters and no, no Taiwanese will use the simplified character characters. So I think and 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 so therefore 2018 was a was a very difficult time because that time uh, the Han Liu, the Han Wei and social media and that time uh, this populism. So I think the disinformation sometimes will, will mix with the populism. But now it is a kind of fading away this is this, this kind of a, uh, the, a populism so i think this is still an issue that we have to take very seriously and thank you so one, much. More, one, one more thing to about about carries you mentioned about the hong kong today it is like uh, taiwan 1975 uh i would say yes under authoritarian 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 rule was just very worse are similar but again 1975 the struggle for democracy has a, a vision to see the light, to see the future. But I, mm. I doubt in Hong Kong today, I really don't know uh, the movement leaders, the few can see the light of the future. So I think that's the only difference. Mm. Okay, well, thank you, Michael. I was hoping to ended on a slightly more positive note, but however, I'm, well, I, I'm going to, I'm sorry uh, to the audience that I wasn't able to get to some of the questions they asked uh, about economic development and democracy, about ethnicity and democracy, but thankfully many of these topics were already touched upon. I think um, the audience will agree that this has been a most invigorating and stimulating discussion we could be here for a much longer time, but I'm going to let everybody go. And I think that one of the um, questionnaires here have the comment that says it all. And that is coming from a democracy activist. And the person says, I don't have a question. I just want to thank all of you. Thank you so much for being inspirational and empowering for activists like me. So thank you for that comment. And I couldn't agree more. Um, so. Many, many thanks, and I hope to see all of you uh, back for other events. And to my panelists, I can't, uh, I couldn't have spent a better evening anywhere else. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.